Three huge pitched battles were fought in England in 1066, the second being Stamford Bridge which equaled Hastings, fought three weeks later, in its merciless brutality even by the violent standards of the day. The supposed heroics by one unnamed large Norseman have passed into legend. Or history. So the story goes, a lone Viking stood on a bridge over the River Derwent at Stamford near York, the 25th of September 1066, and fought to the death, taking countless English warriors with him. He was one of 9,000 warriors who had invaded northern England so that their fierce king, Harold Hardrada, could campaign southwards and claim the English crown. He believed that descendants of Norse who had settled in England's Dane law would support him. Allied to him was Tostig, Harold's own brother, who had been ousted from his Northumbrian earldom the year before, and was looking for revenge by persuading this famous and feared Viking to invade England. Their huge invasion force of veteran warriors had already sacked coastal towns, shattered one English army in battle only five days before and secured the surrender of York itself, whose magnates promised to give hostages and tribute if they didn't sack the city. The meeting point was to be a few miles away at a nodal point of local roads which met near to a narrow old bridge over the River Derwent at Stamford. So, on this hot summer's early morning, the Norse army relaxed on both banks awaiting the York magnates with their hostages. So warm was the weather that they hadn't brought their chain mail. No enemies should be expected nearby now that the northern English army had been vanquished and the new English king, Harold Godwinson, was 250 miles away on the south coast waiting for the Normans to invade. He couldn't possibly get here and stop them. Soon, as the sun gathered its morning power, the Norsemen started to see huge clouds of dust rising on the western horizon from the direction of York. It must be the York VIPs with their tribute. Finally. Then glints of metal caught the sun like a sea of broken ice. Weapons. But whose? Surely King Harold couldn't have got here so quickly. The Norse king quickly ordered his troops on the western bank fighter delaying action to hold off this army whilst he scrambled his main army on the eastern bank into battle formation. Messengers were dispatched to the 3,000 men with their ships moored at Rickcall, 16 miles away, to hurry to his aid. As the army approached, it was clearly the army of King Harold. He had made an incredible ride from the south in four days and nights, barely sleeping. His standards, the Wessex dragon and the fighting man were spotted fluttering before his mounted, elite housecarl bodyguard, thanes and the feared on foot behind. English armies at this time usually rode to a battle. Then dismounted, as horses were too valuable to risk. But seeing the scrambling Norsemen in the distance, that his planned ambush of the Vikings had worked, and wanting to take advantage of their complete disarray, he sped his housecarls up and into the Norsemen guarding the bridge. Primary sources say that they were soon massacred but for one large Viking, wisely having worn his chain mail. With incredible skill and bravery he slew many English, thus delaying the English and blocking them from attacking his 6,000 comrades behind him. Supposedly, he slayed 40 attackers with his axe, before he was finally dispatched by either an arrow, javelin, or from underneath via the slats in the rickety wooden bridge. Sources differ. But did this heroic event before the main battle really happen? Let's examine the primary sources and the likelihood of the event militarily. There's actually no firm evidence that the single, bridge, Viking warrior at the Battle of Stamford Bridge really existed. At least it has been heavily exaggerated into myth. Given his dramatic and heroic death, you'd think it would be celebrated in Norse sagas, and yet amazingly they don't even mention him or his deeds at all. This vague but dramatic story does suit both the Vikings and the English, the Vikings get to boast that their man fought 40 English, a highly suspect round number. And the English get to boast that they are cleverer than the Vikings. Unhelpfully, the two English accounts who mentioned this event, Henry of Huntingdon and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, don't give us enough detail, the approximate dimensions of the bridge, the locations of soldiers involved or types of English warriors he's reputed to have killed or held off. Were they feardsmen? Thanes or housecarls? Perhaps this one valiant Norse man, the last of the slaughtered Norse troops on the English bank of the Derwent could have held off a few attackers one by one and, 
By skill and luck dodging missiles, he slowly gave ground back along the bridge towards his comrades until he was slain. But 40. In Norse mythology, Jalabru is a bridge which spans the river Jijul in the underworld, which is thatched with glittering gold. It appears in a story of a son of Odin, Hamad. He is sent to retrieve a fallen god from the underworld, but when he arrived at the bridge he was challenged by the giant maiden Modgud who demanded that he state his name and business before allowing him to pass. Two other such legends which could easily have inspired later writers to insert drama and rhetoric are the heroics of Horatius at the bridge and the epic tale of the hiker. Here's what the primary sources closest to the events had to say, as well as some recent scholarly opinion. Heimskringler. No mention at all in the saga of Harald Hardrada by Snorri Sturluson, writing in the early 1300s. The Norwegian sources themselves didn't name such a hero. Strange for a culture based upon heroic tales and Valhalla. The Abingdon, Anglo-Saxon, Chronicle, version C, written in the mid-11th century. The manuscript breaks off in the middle of the account of the Battle of Stamford Bridge itself, as if interrupted. It is heavily damaged by fire in the 18th century. Prior to and after this, scribes are believed to have copied from other chronicle sources, or appended this one. Plus, an anonymous scribe added the episodes about this Viking warrior as an anecdote in the columns in the 12th century. Then was there one of the Norwegians who withstood the English people, so that they might not pass over the bridge, nor obtain the victory. Then an Englishman aimed at him with a javelin, but availed nothing, and then came another under the bridge, and pierced him terribly inwards under the coat of mail. The Worcester, Anglo-Saxon, Chronicle, version D. After 1054 it appears to have been worked on at intervals, and has material that appears only in this version, such as the Mercian Register. It has no mention of the bridge event at all, and the account seems to correspond with more concise 12th century Scandinavian saga accounts. The Norwegians who survived took flight, and the English attacked them fiercely as they pursued them until some got to the ships. Some were drowned, and some burned, and some destroyed in various ways so that few survived and the English remained in command of the field. The Peterborough, Anglo-Saxon, Chronicle, version E. The original was lost after a fire in 1116, but a fresh copy was made from a Kentish version. Most likely from Canterbury. Again, no mention of the Norse hero at all. Henry of Huntingdon's Historia Anglorum, 1154. According to Encyclopedia.com, collating from credible, published sources like Oxford University Press. As a chronicler, Henry of Huntingdon is a valuable independent source for the period of his own lifetime, but he is inferior both as a historian and as a stylist to William of Malmesbury. Dr. Paul Hayward on Lancaster University website says. The text is not, however, lacking in rhetorical artifice. Some passages are invented, and it is organized around the idea that the five invasions of Britain, by the Romans, the Picts and Scots, the Angles and Saxons, the Danes and the Normans, represent the five punishments which God has inflicted on the island's peoples because of their sinfulness. Henry's work follows the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, version C and E, with minor additions, and his personal touches draw from current legend, his own royal court experiences and his fertile imagination. For example, C. Warren Hollister notes the anecdote of King Canute's failure to stem the tide by command and Henry first's ignoring his physician's orders to dine on lampreys. Here a single Norwegian, whose name ought to have been preserved, took post on a bridge, and hewing down more than forty of the English with a battle axe, his country's weapon, stayed the advance of the whole English army till the ninth hour, i.e. three o'clock in the afternoon. Michael Wood wrote in In Search of the Dark Ages, 1981. The English launched their attack, first of all, it seems, on a Norse covering force on the York side of the river. Was Harold trying to transfer forces to delay the English crossing and give his reinforcements a better chance of turning the issue? According to Florence of Worcester, Harold could deploy many thousands of heavily armed, well-trained troops, which suggests an elite royal army. 
there is certainly no need to confine Harold to the simplest shield wall tactics. Though we cannot prove or disprove the Norse account that he employed mounted javelineers with his housegals in that modern style by now well known on the continent. At this stage the Norwegians attempted to hold the bridge, and a tradition recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says that eventually a single Norseman heroically defied the English for a while before he was killed. R. Alan Brown stated in The Norman Conquest of England, 1995. The original text of Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, version C stops at this point. A well-known edition, The Lone Viking Story, in a much later hand reads as follows and finally ends the C version. Peter Rex wrote in 1066 A New History of the Norman Conquest, page 78. The fighting at this stage was loose and light and the Norwegians managed to hold their line of battle despite heavy losses. They now formed a semicircular shield wall and fought their way back to the bridge. There would have been a pause while both sides regrouped and rested and the English tried, at first in vain, to cross the bridge. Also in his The English Resistance The Underground A War Against the Normans. Page 18. Accounts of the battle from English sources are sparse and Norse sources are eerily reminiscent of an account of the Battle of Hastings transposed to Stamford Bridge. The Heimskringler speaks of cavalry attacking in small groups and wheeling away and of how serious a matter it was for the English to ride against the Norwegians. But it also claims that the English attacked the Norwegians by circling around them on horseback, like the attacks around pioneers' wagon trains, which, because the battle was fought on a plain, and despite the English not being known for an ability to mount cavalry charges, is quite possible. Frank McLean quotes from 1066 The Year of Three Battles. It is clear that the Horatius-like stand at the bridge held the English up far longer than expected, and we hear of a single giant Norwegian warrior who is supposed to have slain 40 Saxons with a battle axe. If Harold had archers, it is surprising that he did not take this defender out with long-range arrow fire, but perhaps this option clashed with his notion of chivalry, this would be consistent with the story that the defender was offered clemency by the English as a mark of their admiration for his valor. But he refused it and taunted his foes with being a pack of cowards. In the end the attackers lost patience and all thoughts of chivalry were thrown to the winds. Ian W. Walker wrote in Harold the Last Anglo-Saxon King. The account at the end of Chronicle C of a lone Norwegian holding the bridge against the English is a much later addition to the text. It was perhaps drawn from a later English saga about the battle and probably has no basis in fact. In his A Mislocated Battlefield? Battle Flats, The Battle of Stamford Bridge, 1066, Michael C. Blundell, says that. The general acceptance of Battle Flats as the location of the battle appears to have been based on a single line in Manuscript C of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. William of Malmesbury's recounting of the story in his Gesta Regum Anglorum is the most detailed. The English won the day and put the Norwegians to flight, but the victory of such large and powerful forces was interrupted for many an hour, a thing posterity may hardly believe, by a single Norwegian, who is recorded to have taken his stand at the entry to the bridge called Stamford Bridge, and by killing two or three and then more of our side to have prevented them all from crossing called upon to surrender, that a man of such physical strength might receive generous treatment from the English. He spurned the invitation with a frown and kept taunting the enemy, saying they were a poor lot if they could not deal with a single man. But one of the king's bodyguard hurled an iron javelin at him from a distance, and as he was demonstrating boastfully, rendered more incautious by justified confidence, this pierced him through and he yielded the day to the English. Firstly, how many Norse warriors had a grasp of the English language? Or much later scribes having the translations? Hardrada himself didn't speak English as noted from the sources when reporting the Pali, and he was a well-traveled noble. And how was a single Viking not hit by launched weapons from an army of troops nearby? The English, spread out on the bank, could have covered a wide angle of attack, maybe 90 degrees. 
In that span, even a single line of archers or javelineers could have numbered perhaps 50 men and easily hit this Viking. In the much later Napoleonic Wars, the British line of soldiers' tactic had successfully and repeatedly beaten the French column tactic with this wider angle of firing. So was it some kind of chivalry on King Harold's part that he admired the heroics of this warrior and allowed his life until rebuffed? The most likely scenario in my view is as follows. King Harold of England's undetected army of mostly Thegans and Housegarls rapidly advanced towards the Norse on foot and horse from York in the early morning of September 25, 1066. Many feared men on foot will have caught up with him there, whilst resting overnight from his gruelling, fast four-day and night ride north. In order to avoid being sacked and the horrors which that involved, York's magnates had recently been forced to submit to Harold Hardrada, whose veterans had just massacred an English army under Brother Earls Edwin and Morcar only five days prior. So, York promised to make terms and give VIP hostages, which would be brought to the Norse at nearby Stamford days later, where many local roads met near the River Derwent. The autumn day itself was described as being hot. And the Norse army had left their chainmail etc. with their guarded fleet, 16 miles away at Rickcall. They were spread out and relaxing on both banks of the Derwent, some hustling cows, awaiting the York magnates. Spanning the deep, 30 to 40 feet wide Derwent was a narrow wooden bridge with slattered boards, who knows how old it was even then, supposedly only wide enough for two to three men to walk or fight. We don't know if it was a footbridge or for farm carts, etc. Harold's men first noticed clouds of dust in the near distance, unsure if it was hostile. Surely Harold could not have moved north so rapidly with an army? Soon, glinting weapons and armor revealed that it was clear that it was a hostile army. Harold's. Hardrada quickly ordered those men on the western bank to fight a delaying action against the charging English, whilst he rapidly formed up on the eastern bank with his main army, on what is now known as Battle Flats. He sends for help from his fleet guard 16 miles away. Though the English way of war was to ride to battle then dismount, horses being too valuable to slaughter, I think that Harold's housegarls and Thegns would have taken advantage of the ambush momentum and disarray of the Norsemen, and immediately attack without waiting or dismounting, killing all that they could, with infantry dashing behind in support. Now, the sources conflate two possible timelines for the Lone Viking, as they do with the Malfoss incident in the Battle of Hastings. But, either. Theory A. Before the main battle. As his comrades were wiped out on the western bank defending the crossing, the single Norse man alone was left, halting the rapid advance of the English over the bridge by blocking it with his bravery and skill for a short time. Some sources suggest he did so for hours, which I find unlikely. Another source says his sheer courage is briefly admired by Harold, who offered him clemency, again he is reported showing this with Norse survivors later, which the Viking rebuffs and is killed. Theory B. During the main battle. The English, having wiped out all of the Norsemen on their side of the river, poured across the open bridge to engage Hardrada's main army, whose shield wall was now arranged almost circularly. If the reality was A, maybe he killed a handful of feardsmen and housegarls, unlikely the latter so easily. Retreating slowly to avoid missiles etc. as the various sources state, before being killed either by an arrow, a javelin or from underneath. Harold supposedly offers a parley to Tostig and Hardrada in a famous, but doubtful, dialogue, which is rejected. If the reality was B, the English kill him and cross the bridge to engage the Norse army and their English-Flemish allies in a bitter fight of attrition. Some housegarls supposedly still on horses, in the modern style, attacking with overarm spears. Ori Einstein, in charge of the fleet guard now arrives and, although exhausted already, they crash into the English, causing them to falter. The sources say the English are driven back temporarily, with the Norse even retaking the bridge. Is it from this moment where the bridge Viking myth possibly started?
The English gain back ground and the Norse struggle on valiantly, but Hardrada is slain with an arrow in his throat, then Tostig is cut down and slowly the Norse are slaughtered and break for their fleet, but are pursued by Harald's mounted men and killed in various ways, say the sources. King Harald was merciful and allows Prince Olaf, Hardrada's son, and the shattered survivors to sail home having given oaths. Only 24 out of 300 ships are needed to sail them home. Over 90% had been slaughtered. Would Harald really pause his entire army due to chivalry and let this hero delay him? He had completely surprised the enemy. Also, Duke William was going to invade England's south coast at any time. Harold needed to win quickly and get back down to the south coast. Even without time constraints, why allow this man to inspire his comrades nearby? Allowing the Norse enemy to grow bolder and stronger. King Harold's whole army was there by the riverbank and the bridge, which we might assume to be waist height as the hero was swinging his axe. So, facing one man, wouldn't the English archers and javelineers, as Michael Wood calls them, have had at least an easy target with which to assail him with hundreds of missiles? A martial artist on Quora stated. A skilled melee combatant can, given the right terrain, defeat multiple armed opponents provided he, she fights them one at a time. Like on a bridge, stairway, or a alleyway, and is overall better prepared, equipped, or stronger than they are individually. Generally, doing so is a death sentence, as your more numerous opponents are eventually going to figure out how to get rid of you, or exhaust you, because by default, you have committed yourself to holding a single location, making defeating you a simple matter of either forcing you to fight at a different location, or exploiting the terrain against you. While it's not impossible for a skilled combatant to take down a small group of surprised, poorly equipped, armed, or not as trained combatants in melee, that's generally the exception, rather than the rule. Lastly, we can assume that Harold would have sent in his best against this Norse hero, the elite and formidable housegarls which spearheaded all English armies. These tough professionals were armed, housed and paid by their earl or king and, by 1066, numbered 3,000 in England. They wore chain mail, had conical nasal helmets and were highly trained with sword, spear and the dreaded Dane axe. These men would step forward of the English shield wall, dig their shield in the ground and swing the lethal axe in a figure of eight to build up momentum. Such was its speed and sharpness that it could cut horse and mail-clad rider in two. The headless bodies and mutilated limb scenes of the Bayou tapestry are testament to their effectiveness and ferocity. and their fearsome reputation was well deserved. Even the historian, poet, and politician, Snorri Sturluson, writing the Norse sagas in the early 13th century said of them, England would be very hard to conquer. It was very populous and the warriors were who were known as the king's housecalls were so valiant, that any one of them was worth two of the best men in King Harald's army. They were the reason why the battles at Stamford Bridge and Hastings lasted far longer than the usual two to three hours per battle. Men who took oaths and swore not to leave a battle without their lord, but to die for him. So, considering all of the above, I personally think that the Viking on the bridge story as we are famously told it, is a literary device either partly or wholly invented by later writers. As was much of the revolt of Boudicca as told by Cassius Dio and Tacitus.